I want to start with thanking Vicky here um, for inviting me to be with you so, so bright and early. Um, <laughs> you, you are morning people. Um, I was checking actually the Twitter feed from uh, yesterday and um, to see what you're doing and what you're saying to each other and kind of snooping on you. And, uh, but you know, it was very impressive stuff, but I have to say my heart sank. I mean, you had policymakers, you had visionaries, you had community leaders. <laughs> And then you have me um, to give the keynote speech. So something went wrong here. Um, I, am, I am just a storyteller and a journalist. So um, I don't know if what I have to say will you know, stacks up against what you heard yesterday. But this is the advantage of being the first one, the first item on the agenda, because it you know, can only go up from here. Let's put it this way. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, if I'm nervous, it's going to be a lot shorter. But, um, but I want to begin with a collage of moments from the last two to three, three to four years to set my conversation with you in a real world context. A context that is within and beyond Canada because I believe that what happens here, what happens somewhere else has repercussions here. The first moment, thousands of children, some as young as three months old, separated from their parents, possibly forever, at the US-Mexico border, and housed in cages and camps. Many can be heard crying, confused, and lost. Some have died from preventable diseases. Their parents merely wanted a better life for them, away from gang wars, drugs, and state violence. Both children, both children and parents were punished for their simple dreams. Another moment, a young student who has spent hours and hours reading websites and posts by far-right nationalist leaders and admiring France's National Front led by Marie Le Pen, storms into a mosque in Quebec City in 2017 and fires indiscriminately, killing six men and injuring many others. In Hungary, Parliament pa passed a law that criminalizes not just migrants and asylum seekers, but any individual or organization that tries to help them. So if you were operating in Hungary, this organization would be considered illegal. Last month, as the Jewish community was celebrating Yom Kippur, a 27-year-old man killed two people outside a synagogue in the town of Hall in Germany a town with only 2% immigrant population. He planned to live stream the massacre in the synagogue to his audience of far-right extremists. He spoke and wrote in English because his audience is universal. This was not a local issue or grievance. Earlier this week, in the French part of the Basque region, an 84-year-old former candidate for the far-right National Party of Marie Le Pen tried to set a mosque on fire when he was stopped by two other men whom he shot, not fatally. Mosques or synagogues, places of worship and serenity, have become target of mass murderers. <clears throat> There's, of course, ch church, Christ Church in New, Zealand, in New Zealand and El Paso in Texas, both this year. In both cases, the killers, and let's just call them what they are, terrorists, have written so-called manifestos lamenting the siege of the white race, and in the case of the El Paso shooter, proposing the creation of a white ethno-state free, free from what he calls the shameless race mixers. In both the United States and the United Kingdom, some political leaders and high-profile columnists talk of infestation, infestation cockroaches, animals, and use verbs like flooding and swarming to dehumanize immigrants and asylum seekers. They are no longer people deserving of compassion or help, but creatures that can be exterminated and allowed to, allowed to drown. There are many, many other examples, but I just didn't want to depress you too much early in the morning. And it even mentioned the whole Brexit situation, <clears throat> fueled as it was, in, in part, on the myth of invading immigrants. 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, 
any one of these stories would have stood out and created a media frenzy that would have lasted for weeks. Maybe even a moral panic, or at the very least, some serious soul searching. In this decade, the 2010s, a cruel, disturbing, heartbreaking, batshit crazy, glad to be almost over, we're two months away, good riddance, 2010s. They are simply dots on a world map that when connected with others, reveal a larger narrative of how we are living race today, not just in Canada, but around the world. No spoiler, but it's ugly out there. And no spoiler when I say <clears throat> it doesn't have to be. These moments also tell us that this narrative is not new, and in fact has played out before. The players and context may be different, but the political opportunism, the persecution on grounds of race or religion or skin color has only shifted laterally to encompass different races, religions, and skin colors. Any cursory reading of current news alongside history books, particularly the 1930s in Europe or the 1940s in the US, will show debates, measures, political actions, and inactions whose echoes can be heard today. While racism as an issue has never disappeared from our world, it has returned with a vengeance and in more resilient, unexpected ways. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice was perfectly fine this morning. It's just psychosomatic. How did we get here? 74 years after the, sec after the end of the Second World War, the establishment of a post-war world order in the West that saw liberal democracies thrive politically and economically. A world order premised on human rights, territorial integrity, the rule of law, and the promise of free trade. What has changed and changed so rapidly? We are conditioned to believe that the arc of history, though long, bends towards progress and not regression. We are not meant to relive nightmares. How could countries, including Canada, described as multicultural success stories, despite the tensions, of course, that erupt to the surface from time to time, become hosts of ideologies that de demonize people inside and outside the borders based on skin color or ethnic origin? Honestly, what the hell is happening? And why is it happening on our timeline? I spent the last seven years working on two books. One has been out, as Vicky mentioned, for three years, and the other one will be out in a year from now. This is not shameless promotion. This is just kind of to put, to put the, what I'm writing in context. I'm, and I spent seven years trying to, to really answer these questions trying to understand why I do feel a little less safe in the world today when, say, 23 years ago, when I first moved to Toronto from England via the Middle East, I thought I landed in a racial paradise. I have several theories not, that are not mutually exclusive by any means, and I want to run them by you one by one. But in trying to come up with theories, explanations, rationales, reasons, I know that I, like everyone here in this room probably, is just trying to impose order on a world where chaos seems to be on the ascendancy. Some may say this is futile. I say it's necessary. We do this because our lives and the lives of our children, friends and family are on the line, literally on the line. Although it's not a theoretical matter, also because there are some values at stake, harmony, shared prosperity, democracy, a vision of Canada that is both mythical and a reality. We have no choice but to explore the futile, to go into the dark, even this early in the morning. Factor one for this upside down world is actually the economy. We wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for the 2008-2009 economic recession, and many would call it a, a mini depression. A financial collapse is by definition a disaster. 
but this one has exposed the major fault line in European and North American attitudes to immigration in ways that none of us could have predicted. It revealed that immigrants, if I may just talk in an, instead of an abstract and as a whole group for a minute, are welcome when the economy is humming along. Their labor is needed, their families are admitted. But when the times get tough, when jobs are scarce, are scarce that labor becomes job stealing and that family turns into the seat of cultural and economic anxieties. As I looked further into the effects of the recession on attitudes to immigrants, I was startled by this fact. Despite the economic recovery of the past few years, the populism that is spawned has not waned. Economic anxieties have masked a host of less charitable attitudes. A recent report in The Guardian makes it clear, and I quote, it's now evident that populism draws strength from public opposition to mass immigration. If the Brexit vote alone was cast based on the economy, Britain would not have left the EU. And of course, in the US, if the vote for Trump was just based on the economy, he wouldn't have won an election. Factor two, before the Arab Spring of 2011, and the wars and revolution that followed in Syria, Libya, Tunisia, my homeland of Yemen, immigration from these countries, or what we call the global south in general, always registered politically and economically. But now, now the numbers, the frequency, the anguish, the fears motivating these refugees and asylum seekers have reached a level the world has not seen before, probably not since the 1940s. Globally, 37,000 people are forced to leave their homes every single day. Every single day, 37,000 people. The number of forcibly displaced has reached a staggering 70 million people. I used to teach a class on sort of idea, immigration and ideas uh, th two years ago, and the number was 65 million two years ago. I had to sort of update, I have to check yesterday to see, and it was actually up to 70 million, five million in the last two years. There's a number within these figures that is near and dear to my heart. 3.2 million people from Yemen, my homeland, are internally displaced, and 200,000 outside the borders of Yemen. All these institutions, declarations that followed the Second World War, proved to be too fragile to deal with a moment of this scale. From the Universal Declaration on Human Rights to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, our best attempts to learn from the past and guard against a, future, a similar future proved less than resilient. This recession, the wave of immigration that it created around the Mediterranean before it spread further afield, has happened as anti-global and protectionist social and economic policies were starting to gain a foothold in many industrialized Western countries. So in a way, it was a triple whammy or a perfect storm, whatever metaphor. I know you had Sharon Bala here last year. She's, she's the queen of metaphors, but I, I, whatever you want to say, is it, is, it, is it the triple whammy, is it the disaster? I don't know, but it is a trio of global recession, global migration crisis, and anti-global sentiments all happening at the same time. They prove that the world that we live in is so intimately connected and yet never more polarized, more hierarchical. We talk of first, third, uh, first, second, and third world countries, super and middle powers, 1% and the remaining 99%. In my last book, I, made, I make an argument that the thread that connects so many of these historical and political shifts can be encompassed in one word, brown. Just the color brown. In this talk, I'll provide an overview of this idea but I also offer a few more arguments that I've been thinking about and developments that have unfolded since the revised edition of the book came out two years ago. I think we really, really need to explore that ambivalent, unique, familiar but strange, light but still dark, though not light enough, world of brown skin to grasp the meaning of brownness as a racial experience and the effect it's having on conversations about race, politics, economy, 
and maybe just the future direction of, Western world, of the Western world. As much as I love using shorthand and collective nouns like people of color, immigrants, I think there's room for a more specific discussions of the racialization experience of specific groups and communities. But first, allow me to define the term brown in more, historical ter more sort of historical context and in the way I've chosen to write about it and talk about it. I'm doing this because I still get some resistance from many communities when I use the term brown to describe them. Lebanese people, I'm looking at you, because I know you like to, to call yourself Phoenician all the time. In the UK, many find it an insult, and in fact, in a bookstore recently, the book was removed from the display into the shelves because a customer complained about the title. The use of color to divide people into racial groups first gained currency in the 18th century. Not coincidentally, just as a different, that happened as different colonial powers in Europe were carving up the world. There's a German anthropologist whose work is fascinating. His name is Johann, uh, Johann Blumenbach, who first introduced the category brown in a revised edition of his book on the natural variety of mankind. That was in 1781. Up until then, four racial groups really existed in the world. Caucasian, white, Ethiopian, black, Mongolian, yellow, and Native American, red. He added a fifth and significant one, browns, or what he called the Malay race. It covered a, a, a large swath of what we would now call South Asia, East Asia, and the Pacific, from Thailand and Malaysia to Pacific Islands and Australia's Aboriginal. For the record, whose brown was always a revolving door and in the eyes of the white beholder. Even now, technically, people from the Middle East are counted as white by the US Census Bureau. Although you'll be hard pressed to convince anyone that a dark skinned Syrian Muslim man of a certain age would be considered white in Trump's America. In this model, and in the racialist science, which continued well into the early decades of the 20th century, the white Caucasian race represented not just physical beauty, but strength, moral character, and good temperament. The lowest rung in the hierarchy, these scientists suggested, was occupied by blacks. <clears throat> Brown, in particular, often occupied that buffer space on the cusp of whiteness and on the edge of blackness. I'm, of course, not using brown and brownness in, on, in, these, in these terms, and by no means am I suggesting that racialist science is to be taken seriously. In fact, in fact, so much of that science has been debunked. But some of these ideas proved very resilient and continued well into the 20th century and provided the blueprint for how brownness came to be understood, or more, more accurately, misunderstood how its middle space, that <clears throat> buffer zone, has worked to facilitate the exploitation of both black and brown populations and the competition for resources between these two non-white groups in different historical settings. In my book, I dwell a lot on the Caribbean, especially Trinidad. I see brownness as both real and metaphorical. While my starting point is to <clears throat> literally look at it in terms of skin tones, not black, not white, I propose a wider frame of reference that takes in, among other issues, brown as a source of cheap labor and a workforce on the move. That's the first one. The second one is the colorization of Islam as a brown menace in the post 9-11 world and in broad strokes, an anxiety about immigration from specific geographic location that just happened to correspond neatly to a brown classification. The Middle East, North Africa, South and South East Asia, Mexico, and parts of Central and South America. This last point can also be conflated with attacks on multiculturalism. Our encounters with race at the present moment in Europe and in Canada and the US is predicated on this brown presence. I'm pretty sure that Quebec's recently announced values test that newcomers have to pass in order to gain residency is not aimed at immigrants from continental Europe. That's the wild guess. This type of anxiety around immigration can be economic or cultural, or about larger demographic trends, 
which, for example, suggests that whites will no longer be the largest demographic group in the, U in the US and that non-whites will become the majority. I want to illustrate that anxiety and how that anxiety can be weaponized. And I have to take you back in time to 2015, the summer of 2015, when Donald Trump announced his presidential bid a year before he won the party's nomination. He immediately and deliberately went on a tirade against illegal immigrants or undocumented from Mexico, who he claimed bring drugs, crime, and commit rape. The choice of Mexican undocumented migrants as a group to target and to rally his future base was, in pure political terms, a master stroke. Certainly not something you'd expect to hear me say about Trump in any other context. It set the tone for the rest of his campaign and much of his presidency to date. By designated undocumented immigrants, Trump knew that he could tap into certain fears, and one of them is the brown immigrant as potentially more criminal than American-born citizen. That's what he and his base believe and want American public to believe. But what do the facts actually say? Facts still matter. Studies and research still matter. Journalism still matters. A study in criminology, a peer-reviewed journal, found no evidence that a sharp increase, increase in illegal immigration in the last 30 years caused what the researchers refer to as commensurate jump in violent crime. So the answer to the White House claims that the undocumented Mexicans are the source of violence in their communities is a resounding no. Looking at nonviolent crime in a separate study, the same researchers found the results to be comparable. Another study found that native-born Americans had higher conviction and arrest rates than illegal immigrants. Border cities are often portrayed as dangerous, violent, drug-addled spaces overtaken by immigrants and the undocumented. But facts and crime rates suggest otherwise. With the safety fear come specific economic anxieties, in particular with white voters with no, with no college education, what in general would be referred to as the working, or working class or lower middle class. This is not specific to the US, and in fact, according to some pre-election studies, federal elections here in Canada, is particularly applicable to Canada. This fear builds on another claim that immigrants, migrants, depress wages. That's an argument that I dealt with in my, first book, in my second book, but it's harder to quantify and is part of a larger conversation about labor and immigration. But again, it has been turned into a blunt instrument, and that is pure politics. One of my students who was working on, um, on a story on, on Russian immigrants recently reminded me that first-generation Canadian immigrants actually earn an average of 16% less than native Canadians. Research also reveals that immig the immigrant wage gap is much more prominent in Canada's private sector than its public sector. Missing from this immigrants the press wages conversation are some crucial facts. One is automation, which has and will continue to render many industrial jobs obsolete. Two, outsourcing, whether to Mexico, China, or whatever, which corporate America has embraced for the last 30 years. And finally, the continuous devaluing of unions and collective bargaining. So do immigrants actually put pressure on wages? Perhaps. Are they the only reason wages are lower and certain jobs disappearing? Hardly. The current moment just tends to, to sort of favor simple and easy to digest analysis. And uppermost among them is the immigrant as the underlying cause of social and economic failures. I go back to the recession of 10 years ago as a turning point. The simple answer is that for the last two decades prior to the Great Recession, the American and Canadian economies depended on the cheap labor they can extract or exploit out of brown migrants and immigrants, particularly in jobs that the vast majority of American-born or Canadian-born workers would not accept. 
By that I mean labor-intensive, poorly paid work in the food or agricultural sectors, in some industrial settings, in the catering and restaurant industry. If you've been to a restaurant and had a look at the kitchen, or you've been to a nursing home, or to an office building after hours in any big city, in the last decade or two, you'll be hard pressed to find that many white workers. Before the recession, in border states in the US, like Arizona, Texas, and California, you couldn't get undocumented workers fast enough into the country. A booming economy like the one we enjoy in Canada needs university educated workers, but it depends on the labor of millions of unskilled or low skilled workers. And yet, research shows that the unskilled laborers, or the unskilled laborer who is usually darker skin, an immigrant or asylum seeker, tends to be the category that tips the scales of public opinion against immigration. In a very sort of simple way, who will build or work at the hotels and restaurants and spas that people with disposable income frequent? Brown people do and have, people from Central America, India, Bangladesh. As you read story after story about Silicon Valley, the mecca of American digital innovation, please remember the tens of thousands of South Asians who work there on the temporary working visa known as H-1B they are the brown elves of the digital workshops, writing code, programming, and often bust in and out of workplaces, living in dormitory-style lodgings. To be brown has become a global simple symbol for cheap labor around the world. Immigrants from brown countries have become the go-to group for mass labor in general. Global economies have an addiction to important cheap labor that sometimes get the, gets the euphemism of temporary foreign workers programs. Like many people with addictions, we are in denial about our condition. That's true for Canada and Kuwait, the US, the United Arab Emirates, Saskatoon, or Singapore. The global economy runs on the labor of brown migrants and immigrants. It's the hidden foundation of this century. This economy may be complex, but the human lives caught in its web tend to follow a very basic desire to do better for themselves and their children. No mother wants to leave her kids behind to raise other people's children for career reasons. No father is willing to risk his life working on a skyscraper in Doha, where on average one migrant worker dies each day in 45 to 50 Celsius heat if they had another way of making a living. In Toronto, Toronto the good, five migrant workers have died at Fiera Foods, a bakery that supplies some of the major supermarkets around the city. The most recent one was crushed by a machine that turned on while he was cleaning it just two months ago. And yet, the stories we tell in the West about these globe-trotting, intrepid workers are often ones of fear, incomprehension, invasion, and the tone just got me even more troubling in the past 10 years. Why do all these examples matter? Why am I depressing the hell out of everyone in this room? Because they have set a pattern for how the lives of immigrants and asylum seekers are discussed, written about, and imagined. I am an immigrant as well. I've been here for a long time, but I'm an immigrant, and I constantly have to defend my humanity, the humanity of people who are Arab and Muslim, our integrity from a barrage of hate crimes, criminal neglect, and social media mobs, from fake news and conspiracy theories. Then and now, it seems that many societies want immigrants, but not people. They want machines that do the jobs, not people who have views, values, families they wish to be reunited with. Whether that's the Muslim population in Europe or the Hispanic community in the US, the South Asian here in Toronto, brown presence is predominantly white, sorry, is predominantly white. Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry again. Brown presence in predominantly white societies is being politically weaponized. What's going on is not a war, but at least it's a fight. 
Liberal democracies are fighting for their lives against the rise of ethnic nationalism, race-based politics, and a generous helping of the playbook of fascists and dictators. Anti-Brown politics, anti-Brown discrimination is destabilizing entire countries and system of, systems of governance that have been in place for decades and replacing it with what has rightly been described as the dictatorship of the majority. Which brings me to the rise of populism and its role in fueling anti-immigrant sentiments. <clears throat> Simply put, populism is a language that frames politics in two very reductive narratives. The will of the people versus the politics of the elite or, polit or the establishment. It encompasses left and right views, and it can, it can be seen in the politics of Modi in India, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump in the U, and Trump in the US. It has literally alt altered the political map of Europe as we know it, since it has cannibalized support from the traditional center-left and center-right parties that have shared or traded power since the end of the Second World War. They were the bedrocks of liberal democracies. Anti-immigration, anti-other, anti-indigenous are some of the telltale signs of a populist movement. But, and there's a big but here, research shows these are not the defining one. The one thing that unites populist leaders and supporters is actually a belief in conspiracy theories about everything from climate change to vaccinations to something that in, the Western, in Western democracy is sometimes described as the white replacement theory or white genocide. Simply put, it's the idea that white European populations are under siege and are being replaced with immigrants of racially inferior stock. Sometimes, the thinking goes, at the instigation of the so-called elite or the deep state. As, we, as with many ideas about racial purity and surrender, the origin of the replacement theory can be traced back to, the Nazi, to Nazi Germany. In 1934, a pamphlet titled, Are the White Nations Dying? was produced by the Research Department for the Jewish Question. Perhaps the most recent and defini definitive articulation comes from the French writer Renaud Camus, whose 2011 book, The Great Replacement, is often quoted in far-right circles. I often read a quote on Twitter that goes along the lines of, you judge the society by how it treats its most vulnerable or its minorities. I'm not importing this saying wholesale because in places like Canada and the US, brown communities are the only demographics showing signs of growth. In Toronto, one in four people in the GTA will be of South Asian, South Asian descent in a decade or two, and Hispanics will count for one in three Americans by 2060. But as the world begins its, or continues its tango with populism and all the conspiracy theories and racial pot stirring, we in Canada carried on believing in what writer and academic Andrew Porter described in the Globe and Mail not that long ago as a renewed faith in Canada's continuing exceptionalism. This is, he claims, you know, in, in part due to our healthier institution and superior values. I think he's referring to something we all know, that it couldn't happen here, defense mechanism that so many of us re revert to in times of crisis. There are some reasons to be smug. According to a recent study by the Samara Center for Democracy, populism in Canada is more likely to be captured in the rhetoric of political leaders than in what regular people say or think. An analysis of the written record of parliament revealed that more, that more than ever, is politicians are complaining about and attacking elites. To some extent, we in Ontario are familiar with this trend through the Ford dynasty and to a lesser extent, Stephen Harper's historical animosity to the so-called Laurentian elites provides an earlier example. But there are more complicating factors that should have us very worried. Between October 2015, when the Liberals swept into power with a decisive majority, and October 2019, when they returned to power with a minority, so much has changed. 
And I invite you to think about the images that when you think about the 2015 election and, and the aftermath of that election, and what are some of the most powerful images you probably all think of Trudeau at the Pearson Airport welcoming Syrian refugees. The Canada is back rhetoric. The, the last election proved definitely that Canada is not back. In fact, it's back to its old ways. While Potter sees the rise of populism in terms of regionalism, the heartland versus Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal elites, I want to explore what I believe to be a more accurate model, the model of ordered populism that pollster Frank Graves and writer and researcher Michael Valpe have referred to in the pre-election studies. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Frank Graves' work. Is he here today by any chance? No, no, well, he's, I mean, I have a lot of admiration for this man and the work he does. I mean, no one, no one has charted Canada's sort of tortured relationship with race and immigration more accurately than, than, he, than he did. But in their study, and I'm gonna quote from it directly, so bear with me, there are four conditions that define order populism. One, a declining middle class, wage stagnation, and hyper-concentration of wealth at the very top of the system. Check. Major shifts in social values, which see more progressive values displacing traditional social conservative values, in turn, that produces a cultural backlash by those seeing themselves falling victim to loss of identity and privilege. If you, if you live in Toronto, if you've been following the news from Toronto, the, um, the conflict around the public library renting space to an anti-trans um, um, speaker sort of triggered a lot of issues around uh, freedom of speech and, and values. Three. A growing sense of external threat expressed in a rise in, in the belief that the world has become overwhelmingly more dangerous, as well as a rise in the perception that the country and its public institutions are moving in the wrong direction. I'll give that a check too. Declining trust in public institutions plus a rise in ideological polarization. Definite check from me. Graves and Valpe argue that all these conditions are present in Canada and they predominate among less educated males. While immigration has not been a ballot issue in Canadian federal elections so far, attitude towards immigrants has emerged as an indicator of voters' intentions and leanings. In the same study, Graves argues, uh, reminds us that in 2013, only six years ago, 47% of conservative supporters thought that too many visible minorities are coming to Canada. The exact phrase he uses is allowed into the country. The figure today is 69%. So it's gone up from 47 to 69%. That's more than two in th out of three. The consensus is shifting. We really are at the crossroads of immigration in Canada, as this conference title suggests. Am I optimistic about the future, or do I think that we in Canada will be spared the worst of these racial tensions just because the party that espoused the most radical version of it, the Maxime Bernier party, got less than 2% in the last federal elections? I guess it comes as no surprise that I, I, I'm not optimistic. The base has simply moved to what is now the official opposition party. What really worries me is what all of this is doing to a sense of belonging, to social cohesion, to multiculturalism, a policy and a way of life that I genuinely believe in and see it. And I see that in front of me every day when I walk into my classroom at Ryerson or wander down the halls. As a teacher, I can't simply see these students and tell them that they have to accept a second class citizenship based on their race or faith or skin color. Sometimes I feel that my hands are tied, defeated. I want to end on a personal story. To set the scene, imagine a beautiful summer night in mid-down Toronto in 2012. My then partner and I were walking alongside Mount Pleasant Cemetery in midtown Toronto when he suddenly asked me, where do you want to be buried? I guess I should have seen it coming since we were walking by a cemetery, but still, the morbidity threw me off nonetheless. 
This was meant to be a romantic post-dinner summer walk. My dream list of questions were included, but was limited, not limited to, do you want to move in together? Like, where do you want to spend our honeymoon? Not where do you want to be buried? We had just braved the crowds in an ice cream shop in, in, on Mount Pleasant, and we had pistachio ice cream, and I even had my Cocker Spaniel you know, dog Chester with us. It was a perfect rom-com scene. I replied right away, Toronto. I was born in Yemen, raised in Lebanon and Egypt, educated in the United Kingdom, but I came to see Toronto and Canada as my home in every sense of the world. I reveled, reveled in the kindness of the city has shown me, and even dedicated my first book, Intolerable, to it. Very few people dedicate books to cities, but I love Toronto so much that I dedicated it for giving me my home. It felt more like a homeland than anywhere else in the world, almost from the moment I landed in this airport. Again, that was 23 years ago. My, my then partner said that he wants to be buried in, his, in, in Yemen, which is where he came, he was, even though he was born in Detroit to a Yemeni family and spent most of his adult life in, in Europe, and he's an American citizen. I remember thinking how fortunate I must be to claim a a, spot, a dot on the world map as mine, a place for my body to work, play, love, grow old, and when the time comes, be put to rest. My date's response suggested a restlessness, an unbelonging from which I was immune. As I said, the exchange happened in August of 2012. Barack Obama was three months away from getting reelected. Angela Merkel ran Germany with efficiency and compassion, and I knew Donald Trump mostly as a C-list reality star and the gauche millionaire behind the birther movement, another conspiracy theory. I mean, if only we could have seen that coming, right? Back then, very few journalists or colleagues defended the rights of neo-Nazis to free speech with such straight face, at least publicly. But if I were to be asked the same question today, at the end of this, of this decade, I wouldn't know how to respond. I suspect I wouldn't be as definitive about Toronto and Canada as I was at the beginning of it. My day's choice, irrational, troubling, strikes me as reasonable and comforting now. So much has happened to, le to recalibrate my affinities and force me to rethink my resting place, my belonging, Maybe it's about me getting older, but I think it's about the world becoming less hospitable and a whole lot meaner to people crossing borders in general. This is what this decade has done to me, and no doubt to millions others. It made us question our place in the world in a literal and philosophical sense. This is exhausting, unhealthy. And if I, a tenured professor at a university, a writer who's well-connected and adjusted feel that way, then what do newcomers or even older generations of Canadians of different economic and ethnic backgrounds must be thinking or experiencing? I live a sheltered life to some extent. That's why the work you do here in this conference and through and beyond Pathways to Prosperity is so important, so necessary. We need to reaffirm our commitments to a free and equal society, to a Canada that acknowledges its historical past and is determined to a path of reconciliation with indigenous nations, while also, also welcoming those who seek to start a new life for themselves on its shores. Let's not let this chapter of history end where conspiracy theorists, anti-science, anti-choice, and anti-immigration forces want it to end. A happier ending, better ending is possible. That ending will also mark the beginning for the next wave of newcomers and new Canadians. I personally can't think of a better torch to pass on to them. Thank you so much for listening.